Greetings, everyone, and welcome once again to the Velikovskian channel, where we examine ancient history and ancient mysteries from the perspective of the ideas of Emmanuel Velikovsky. As you might know, Velikovsky's two most fundamental propositions were A, that ancient history, as found in the textbooks, is wrong, and B, that great natural catastrophes occurred within the span of recorded human history. And the furthermore, these catastrophes had a profound influence upon the development of the early civilizations. Now, bearing that in mind, I want to look today at the rise of the first civilizations and the spectacular cosmic events which accompanied their rise. Universally throughout the globe, we find a tradition which tells of a great flood or a deluge, a catastrophic inundation of the whole earth caused, we are told, by incessant rains and by enormous tidal waves. After this cataclysm, God or the gods leave a sign that they do not intend to destroy the world again by water, or at least that they wish to be reconciled with mankind. A tower or a bridge, rainbow-coloured often, appears. This tower or world mound or pillar is invariably located at the North Pole. And indeed, the term North Pole recalls the legend. To this day, children still expect to find a pole or a pillar at the Earth's northern axis. The pillar or pole or tower or world mountain occupies a central position in all of the world's mythologies. These, of course, vary enormously in their telling of the tale, yet always we find a few recurring themes. After the flood, men, or a race of gods, or a race of giants, seek to re-establish the link with heaven. To that end, they construct an enormous tower. The supreme god, however, is angered by such ambition, and the tower is destroyed in a great battle. Often, the supreme god finally destroys the tower with a thunderbolt. Traditions throughout the world report that it was after the destruction of the tower that men's languages became confused. This story is found in the Bible, among the Mayas of Mexico, and among the Polynesian people in the Pacific. A fairly typical version of the tower story was told by the Greeks. Here, we hear of a revolt by the giants, or the titans, against the Olympian gods. Seeking to assault Olympus, the giants raise an enormous tower by piling mountains on top of each other. But the gods rally their forces, a great battle ensues, and the tower is destroyed when Zeus strikes it with a thunderbolt. A similar version is found among the Celts, and Irish tradition tells of an epic battle at Ma Tura, the plain of the tower, where the Fomorian giants are destroyed by the Tuatha de Danann, the gods, who are led by Lu or Lugos. Lu kills Balor, the leader of the giants, with a spear of light. What are we to make of such a story, one that is found with only minor variations throughout the world? Velikovsky died before he could tackle the problem in any detail, though he did briefly allude to it in his book In the Beginning, one that has only recently been published. Velikovsky saw an allusion to a cosmic catastrophe in the story of the tower's destruction, and rightly placed this catastrophe at the beginning of high civilization. Since Velikovsky's death, other scholars have turned their attention to the tower, so central to virtually all of mankind's mythical tradition. For most researchers, it soon became clear that the positioning of the tower at the North Pole made it impossible that it could have been a human construction. Evidently, the tower was some form of natural phenomenon, one that appeared at the pole in the wake of the Great Deluge. As early as the 1940s, Velikovsky himself had argued that electricity or electromagnetism played a far greater role in the ordering of the solar system than hitherto admitted. The Great Flood itself, he asserted, was accompanied by a major electromagnetic disturbance in the planetary system. Now, the Earth is in fact a gigantic magnet. Could it be, the thought several researchers, that the deluge had brought some dramatic change in the Earth's electric magnetic charge, and that the tower or pole or world tree was some form of plasma funnel that appeared in the wake of the flood catastrophe? If this is the case, then it would explain the differing forms of the tower and the differing interpretations of the phenomenon found in the world's myths. A plasma funnel is unstable and would have been seen as a flickering and shape-changing pillar of light, sometimes crystalline in appearance, at other times multicoloured like a rainbow. 
On occasion, the funnel may have put out great filaments of plasma resembling branches of a tree, hence the tree of life or the world tree. Occasionally, these filaments may have resembled the limbs of a giant, hence the titan Atlas, who held the heavens on his shoulders. In primeval tradition, the tower or pillar is invariably linked to the god Hermes or Mercury, the messenger of the gods. In view of the fact that the tower was seen as a link between heaven and earth, or as an attempted link between heaven and earth, the connection with Mercury, the swift-moving messenger of the gods, should not surprise. Mercury carried a wand known as the caduceus or the Kerikeon, which was his means of travelling between gods and men. The caduceus was portrayed as entwined with coiled serpents. Legends about the tower frequently allude to entwined serpents or dragons who dwell at his base. Such, for example, is found in the British legend of Merlin and Vortigern. Clearly then, the tower or pole was the prototype of Mercury's caduceus. Now, the earliest phase of civilization in all parts of the globe is characterized by an obsessive interest in a pillar entwined with coiled serpents. This motif is found with great frequency in early dynastic Egypt and early dynastic Mesopotamia, but is also found in the Americas and East Asia. As well as being the messenger of the gods, Mercury was also a phallic deity. He was honoured throughout the Hellenic world at phallic standing stones. In Egypt, at the start of the First Dynasty, we find that the phallic god Min who gives his name to the first pharaoh, Minna or Menes, is the most prominent deity. His image occurs everywhere in first dynasty art. It is evident then that the cult of the phallus, as well as the custom of circumcision, is connected with the legend of the tower and the tower's destruction. Such being the case, circumcision would appear to have been originally some form of expiatory blood sacrifice for the destruction of the tower. The Hebrew story of Abraham who initiates circumcision among the Jews, and who is placed shortly after the destruction of the Tower of Babel, evidently therefore belongs alongside Min and the First Dynasty of Egypt. However, we can go much further than that. For the Tower legend, as well as the story of its destruction and the custom of circumcision, also occurs among the peoples of the New World, and the natives of Mexico and Peru place these events right at the start of their civilizations. Such being the case, and remembering that the destruction of the tower was a natural event witnessed by all the peoples of the earth, it is clear that the civilizations of the New World commenced simultaneously with those of the Old, and that the chronology of the early civilizations as found in the textbooks is completely erroneous. When, then, did the catastrophe of the tower, which immediately preceded the rise of Egypt, of Mesopotamia, and of the civilizations of the New World, occur? Evidence to be presented in future video will show that the tower disaster, which is marked by a three metre deep layer of debris underneath the city of Ur in Mesopotamia, and by debris layers in all of the ancient sites of the world, occurred around 1300 BC. It was in the century after that that all the world's high civilizations developed. If you like this video, please click the like icon and please subscribe to my channel. It would help me very much. Thank you.